The wilds of southern Africa teem with life. While most consider big cats or huge tuskers as the true wild icons of Africa, few appreciate the smaller creatures that dominate the land, the antelope. They too have rich stories filled with the daily struggle to survive. An intricate array of trials and tribulations centered on the need to feed and breed. With stories no less compelling, they're rarely told. Of these, two antelope outnumber all others, Springbok and Impala. For both, life in the herd is critical to their success. The long, lazy days of summer in southern Africa are coming to an end. While conditions are cooling down, however, relationships in the bush are heating up. It's the rut, mating season for impala. At this time of the year, males fight each other for mates. Between fighting off rivals and chasing down females, life is tough. There's little time for eating and males quickly lose condition. This is the toughest time of the year and the most important because only the winners will go on to mate. The plains of southern Africa teem with antelope. There are more species here than on any other continent. These range in size from tiny dakers and steenbok, weighing about as much as a domestic cat, to massive earland that are the size and weight of a large cow. From forests to deserts, antelope are the backbone of the environment. But no matter whether they're big or small, all species are herbivores and therefore are closely tied to the prevailing environmental conditions. Fed by moist winds blowing in across the warm Indian Ocean, the east receives lots of rain, often more than a thousand millimeters a year, and is covered in thick, lush vegetation. Meanwhile, the western parts are drier, receiving less than 500 millimeters of rain a year, and semi-desert environments dominate the landscape. Water is scarce, and food is often limited and difficult to find. Droughts here are regular and severe. Temperatures regularly soar into the 40s. And every plant and animal living here is specially adapted to overcome the rigors imposed by the conditions. Meanwhile, the eastern parts of the region are more congenial, 
moist savannas pulsating with life dominate. It's more humid and not overly hot, with temperatures hovering pleasantly in the mid-30s year-round. The vegetation is lush and green. More often than not, there is plenty of food to go around. Across this continental divide, two species of antelope in particular thrive. In the lush wooded savannas of the east, impala eat a broad diet and are incredibly successful. Their total population has been estimated at more than two million individuals. Only one antelope outnumbers them. The springbok. More than two and a half million individuals range across the dry, open plains of the West. Here they dominate thanks in part to their ability to eke out a meal even in the toughest conditions, and they feed on just about any greenery they find. Together, these two species are the most successful herd-living animals in Africa. Herding behavior evolved following the last ice age, as the forests covering the continent receded. Animals moved out onto the new grassy plains for the first time. They grew larger and began to cover greater distances in search of food. And it became important for individuals to stick together in herds so that they could easily find mates and better protect themselves against predators. Despite their abundance, springbok and impala almost never occur in the same habitat and roughly follow the dry, wet divide. Without them, Africa would be a very different place. In the arid heartland of South Africa, lies the 88,000 hectare Karoo National Park. This is one of the country's most spectacular parks, draped across the Nuverfelt Mountains that rise from open plains which millions of years ago were an inland sea. Just about every animal living here is specially adapted to surviving the desiccating conditions. A small herd of springbok is grazing across the meager landscape of the scrubby plains. Springbok are small gazelles standing roughly 70 to 90 centimeters at the shoulder and weighing up to 45 kilograms. They're hardy characters, capable of suffering through even the toughest of droughts. Travelers through the Karoo during the late 1800s wrote of gigantic herds of migrating springbok so numerous they took all day to pass their camps. These would move vast distances across the arid plains, taking advantage of the unpredictable and variable rainfall of the region. These great congregations are a thing of the past. In modern times, farming has disrupted ancient migration routes. And in the Karoo, Springbok are relegated to small herds sprinkled across the landscape. Five hundred kilometers east in the world-famous Kruger National Park in the wetter eastern parts of the country, a herd of impala is picking its way through the lush vegetation. 
life is very different. The Kruger, as it is fondly known to locals, is a gigantic swathe of savanna bushveld stretching almost two million hectares along the northeastern border of South Africa. One of the largest and most successful wildlife reserves anywhere on Earth, Kruger is crowded with animals. Food is plentiful, and giant herbivores such as elephants and giraffes pick from the top branches of the trees while at their feet, great herds of other browsers and grazers pick their way through the landscape. It's also home to some of the highest densities of predators in Africa. More than a hundred thousand impala munch their way through the thick bush. Impala are taller than springbok, standing almost a meter high at the shoulder and weighing up to 76 kilograms. With so much food and water available, a host of other browsers prosper. A small family of kudu browsers nearby. Together, kudu and impala often form loose mixed herds. these aggregations do have some benefit. In a world controlled by carnivores, with almost half of all impala deaths caused by predators, the more eyes on the lookout, the better. Predators also range across the arid plains of southern Africa. But animals here worry as much about avoiding the heat and finding enough food as they do about being eaten. Where the borders of South Africa, Namibia and Botswana meet is one of the dry western region's most iconic reserves, the Khalakhari Transfrontier Park. Springbok are the most common antelope here. During summer, it's hot, with midday temperatures well into the 40s more often than not. Springbok fare better than most. They eat pretty much anything they find, switching between grass and herbaceous shrubs and succulents as dictated by the conditions. This young male is pawing up fresh shoots from the riverbed. Once he's eaten his fill, he heads for the shade to digest his meal. Springbok are masters at avoiding the heat. They face their white rumps to the sun, reducing the amount of heat absorbed. White underbellies also absorb less of the heat radiating up from the ground below. And they seek out shade to avoid the roasting conditions. Gathering in the shade of these acacias has another benefit. Springbok eat the fallen seed pods, and this is a valuable source of nutrition for them in tough conditions. 
the tree relies on the springbok to disperse their seeds. The pods contain extremely tough seeds that are resistant to the springbok's digestive system. As the springbok move off, they carry the seeds with them before eventually depositing them elsewhere in a nutrient-rich pile of droppings, giving the seed every chance of germinating. But one drawback of avoiding heat stress by gathering in the trees is that the close confines make it easier for predators to hunt them. A lone cheetah is stalking down the dry riverbed. They're the fastest terrestrial mammal and can reach speeds of up to 110 kilometers an hour for short distances. The springbok have seen his approach. He's still far away, so they're not concerned. They have the edge as long as they get a head start on the cat. Nearby, a meerkat family is not so sure. Meerkats are 25 to 30 centimeters long and weigh about a kilogram. They're prime targets for raptors and a host of ground-dwelling predators, including the cheetah. They can't outrun cheetahs like the springbok can. So they rely on burrows when threatened. Just like the antelope, vigilance is key. The family deploys sentries to make sure they're not taken by surprise. This allows the rest of the family to root around for food below. Even the ground squirrels take advantage of their neighbor's early warning system. Each threat has its own unique call. The sentry sounds a warning, and the family scurries below. A close relative, the slightly larger yellow mongoose, is sharing the meerkat's home. But he's no freeloader and will often participate in burrow maintenance and even help extend the underground network of tunnels if required. Most of all, however, the yellow mongooses also benefit from their hypervigilant housemates. And vigilance is key to survival when you're on the wrong end of the food chain. No matter the habitat, whether in the dry west or lush east, herbivores always outnumber carnivores. Life is easier in the east, where there are plenty of plants available. But plant matter is hard to digest. Impala have an arsenal of tools to overcome the challenge. This female is chewing the cud. She's grinding leaves with her teeth, adding enzymes all the time from her saliva. Then she swallows. And then regurgitates the food so she can chew it some more. Every time the cud's swallowed, it's mixed with enzymes and microbes in the stomach to break down the tough cellulose of plant material. Without the repeated chewing and swallowing, 
ruminants wouldn't be able to obtain the nutrition they require from the plants they eat. It also means they spend less time foraging, giving them more time to rest so they can avoid the heat. Carnivores also rely on the success of this digestive system, albeit indirectly. With predators lurking, impala need to be vigilant in order to survive. Large omnidirectional ears give them excellent hearing. And they have an acute sense of smell, enhanced by their enlarged nasal passages. Their eyesight is excellent at detecting movement at great distances, with a field of vision spanning 300 degrees of horizon. Not all threats come from outside the herd, however. Only male impala carry horns, which they use in disputes over females. This territorial male has spotted an intruder. He takes up an aggressive posture to warn off the challenger. They lock horns and engage in a shoving match designed to determine dominance. Fights seldom cause permanent damage, as long as the loser backs off. Horns are specifically shaped for wrestling other males, rather than stabbing and piercing, which gives them little value for defense. Horns are a hindrance in close bushy confines, and females have no use for them. On the dry, open plains of the arid half of the country, however, it's a different story. Here, both sexes typically bear horns, and scientists have wondered why. One theory suggests springbok females have horns so that their teenage sons resemble them. There is intense competition amongst mature males in mixed herds. So the longer young males look like females, the longer they are ignored by dominance. The latest theory suggests the female's horns have more to do with deterring predators based on how conspicuous the animals are. In the open, antelope are easily spotted by predators and horns are a deterrent, so males and females both have them. The taller you are, the more conspicuous you are, so the bigger the deterrent you need. Which explains why the Hemsbok, a much larger desert wanderer, has impressive horns to match. Like Springbok, these rapier-like weapons are borne by both males and females. It's winter on the fringes of the arid Great Karoo, at the southeastern extent of the Springboks Range. Winter here is breeding season for Springbok. This territorial male is marking the bushes with secretions from glands on his head. He's advertising for mates and warning off rivals. Tension is everywhere.
a young male ignores the warning, and the dominant male puts him in his place. This territory is not big enough for both of them. sees off the challenger for now. On the plains of Africa, only the fittest survive. The dominant male, while battered and bruised, has earned his right to mate with many females, passing on his genes to future generations. Meanwhile, the loser's family tree has come to an end. Back in the wetter eastern parts of Kruger, a dominant male impala is chasing a mate. He's identified a female in estrus and is in hot pursuit. She leads him on a merry dance, and the hapless male can only follow hopefully behind, caught in her spell. He flicks his tongue and nods his head enthusiastically, doing his best to convince his would-be partner. And eventually, she relents, briefly pausing so that he can catch up. Once mated, he'll rarely show any further interest in her, even though she'll remain sexually active for a few more days. During this time, she'll be courted by other males and will almost certainly mate with as many as four additional suitors. The Impala's range extends north to the grassy plains of East Africa. There are no springbok here, but there are five other species of gazelle. Two of them can be found here in the world-famous Ngorogoro crater in Tanzania, thousands of kilometers to the north. Hemmed in on all sides by the steep slopes of the ancient caldera, this is one of the most remarkable landscapes in Africa. Fertile soils from the crater's volcanic history feed a menagerie of wildlife. In Ngorogoro, Grant's and Thompson's gazelle often graze together. Thompson's gazelle, or Tommies, are the most common antelope in East Africa. 
preferring the short grass of wide open plains. They're remarkably similar in both size and color to springbok. It's thought this color pattern helps camouflage the herds from predators such as lions and cheetahs. But camouflage only gets you so far. And all gazelles on the open grasslands of East Africa are also fleet of foot. Back in the dry, open riverbeds of the Khalakhadi Transfrontier Park, athletic ability is paramount. These springbok are pronking. It's suggested this behavior advertises an individual's athletic ability to would-be predators. It may also release pheromones or be an important alarm signal to the rest of the herd. Other, more romantic viewpoints, however, suggest they're simply jumping for joy. Even in more vegetated regions, athletic ability is important to avoid the local predators. Impala can leap effortlessly more than three meters high and 11 meters over the ground. They're also fast. Even so, they're no match for Tsesebe, one of their nearest relatives. Tsesebe are nearly twice the size of Impala and are the world's fastest antelope capable of reaching speeds of nearly 60 kilometers an hour. Hartebeest and wildebeest are also close relatives of impala. At first glance, it seems unlikely that these animals should be so close. Impala are graceful, while everything about the wildebeest is awkward. One thing all members of the family do have in common, however, is they live out in the open, and gather in herds. And great herds attract predators like lions. And leopards. Living in a herd is advantageous. There are many eyes to scan for danger. So, remaining in the herd is important. Sick individuals or youngsters that lag behind are prime targets. It's not only predators who track the herds. A cattle egret is feeding on insects kicked up by passing feet. Feeding alongside herds of antelope gives this individual one and a half times more food than a solo effort. Red-billed oxpeckers also track the herds. They're combing through their fur, looking for an easy meal. The impala tolerate the freeloaders because they're enjoying the grooming. And the oxpeckers are able to remove annoying ticks from even the most hard to reach places.
Ectoparasites such as ticks aren't only an irritant, they also carry disease. So the impala benefit from the service. An entire world revolves around what's left behind by grazing antelope. Copper dung beetles are collecting impala droppings. There are more than 2,000 species of dung beetle. This one is a roller. He pats dung into a ball and rolls it away before burying it. Dung balls are food for the beetles and their young. If he's lucky, his ball will attract a female and she'll lay her eggs in it. He buries the ball safe underground, allowing the developing larvae to slowly eat their way to the surface. By burying these balls, he's also injecting valuable nutrients back into the soil, facilitating plant growth, and ultimately, more food for impala in the great cycle of life. Impala and springbok are very similar in many ways, but they almost never live in the same habitat, with one exception, Etosha National Park in northern Namibia. Located in the arid heart of the Kalahari Desert in the southwest of Africa, this 22,000 square kilometer park is renowned for its bountiful wildlife. Animals here congregate at the reserve's waterholes to survive the parched surroundings. A black-faced impala has come down to the waterhole to drink. She's instantly recognizable by her black facial markings. The black-faced impala is a subspecies that lives across Angola and northern Namibia. It's better adapted to its desert home than the common impala of the east. The two subspecies will readily hybridize if they mingle, but black-faced impala are vulnerable, and Itosha is one of their last strongholds. For this reason, the government of Namibia tries to keep them isolated, but it's tricky. Private game farms stocked with common impala surround Itosha, and so the government works to keep them out of the national park. Down at one of the lush waterholes of Kruger, a herd of common impala drinks nervously. lurks in these waters. Large crocs, such as this one, can be more than four meters long.
Spooked, the Impala dash back to the safety of the bush. But danger lurks here too. The herd becomes separated, enabling a lone cheetah to pick off one of the females. He'll gorge himself on his kill. But cheetahs are the smallest of the big cats, so he must eat quickly. If scavenging lions or hyenas catch wind of his kill, they will steal it. Nervously, he scans the surroundings. Having eaten his fill, he moves on. As the seasons march on, the rains return. It's spring in the moist savannas of the Kruger National Park in South Africa. The trees and bushes are bursting with new growth. New arrivals throng the surroundings. It's lambing season, and the bush is alive with youngsters. Babies suckle from their mothers for the first four and a half months. Everyone in the family is jumpy. Being small in this world makes them a target. Leopards and jackals prey on youngsters. So the females have adapted to synchronize their births. With the young born in times of plenty, there's enough food for lactating mums. And the mass of youngsters swamps would-be predators and reduces individual risk. Still, it's best to be on high alert. A perilous road lies ahead for these youngsters. Only half of them will survive their first year to reach adulthood. But those that do will grow up to take their place in the great herds of Africa. Across the vast open spaces of southern Africa, these two species dominate the landscape. Springbok and Impala are the most numerous antelope, numbering into the millions. Though inhabiting different worlds, together they're the central characters in the giant circle of life that unfolds across southern Africa. From the dry deserts of the west to the moist savannas of the east,
<laughs> These two species are pivotal in the success of both plants and animals living across this divide. For in Africa, Springbok and Impala truly reign supreme.